Good evening. Good evening. If you have a Bible with you, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's the uh, second part of a two part series on adoption, the biblical doctrine of adoption. Last week, uh, the title was Adoption, Our Glorious Privilege. This week, Our Urgent Responsibility. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, at verse 14. Paul says, I did not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the heart that you gave him to do your work. We thank you that you preserved these letters. We thank you for the things that we can glean from them. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who compelled him to love people. And Father, we pray now as we look into your word that you would compel us by your love, by the love that you poured into Paul to imitate him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we saw how the very heart of the gospel is actually this issue of adoption. And we talked about the fact that God wants a family. And he wants to bring as many people into this family as he possibly can. And we talked about the fact that the cross was actually the means of making that happen. That through Jesus Christ, God was able to crack open the Trinity and invite us in. That we would actually take on the position of God's Son and have the relationship of Jesus Christ with the Father. That we might be able to call out and say, Daddy. We talked about the informal nature of that relationship. Well, tonight, I want to look at how this applies to you and me. Specifically, in how we relate to other people. Uh, and I want to see this by looking at how Paul applied this truth to his own life. And I want to start with a historical illustration. One of the ways the early church grew so rapidly through the Roman Empire in the first century was because of something called infanticide. It was actually legal in that culture. If you didn't want your new baby, you could leave it outside on the street so that it would die of exposure. Or you could go to the bridge and throw the baby in the river. This was legal. This was widely practiced. For any reason. And see, the early Christians saw this happening all over the empire. And they started taking in these babies. And they adopted them and, and they raised them. <laughs> and you can imagine, in a few generations, how Christianity multiplied. Now, of course, we see a more sophisticated form of this today in abortion. Uh, but there's also a concern that I have. You know, I know the, the babies that have been killed in the womb, I know where they're at. They're with the Lord. And I rejoice in that. I'm concerned about the people who are being aborted after they're born. People who are aborted emotionally, abandoned, sometimes physically. Many of the young people that God is sending to us have been or are currently being abandoned or abused by their parents in terrible ways. And what we're seeing is a total breakdown of the family in America. These people are without guides. They're without models. They're without help. And many of them wander around purposeless. 
caring nothing about themselves or for their future, and then they go and have kids. We are in need of a radical intervention in this country. We need some Christians who share God's vision of spiritual adoption. Now, I'm not limiting, uh, limiting it to spiritual adoption. Of course, physical adoption is a wonderful thing. And we'll talk more about that. But it must start with the spiritual conviction. Now, Paul has been called many things. He's been thought of as the greatest apostle. He's been thought of as an evangelist, as a church planter, as a missionary, as a discipler, as a trainer. But Paul's perception of himself... I think really is summed up in these four verses. See, I believe that primarily he saw himself as a spiritual father, as a shepherd of souls, and he operated as a church planter and a missionary and evangelist and a disciple, as an expression of his heart, a spiritual father. And to him, these were just tools. They were means to growing and shepherding the family of God. And I think all of his actions were performed in light of this personal view he had of himself. And in the first letter to the Christian church, Paul is instructing his spiritual sons and daughters at Corinth. He was giving them instruction as a father, bringing clarity to the issues they were experiencing as God's family, providing help in a time of desperate need. Since these Corinthian Christians were surrounded by the same kind of society as we're surrounded by, a society utterly given over to immorality, greed, lust, ignorance, they faced similar problems in the church. The tendency of Christians to idolize pastors and speakers, the widespread acceptance of sin in the church, like gossip, sexual immorality, and pride, legal conflict between Christians, suffering marriages due to spiritual ignorance, the abuse of God's grace, and overall doctrinal confusion. And faced with these incredible problems, the cry from Paul in the book of the, in the letter to the Corinthians is, focus on Jesus. Get your eyes off yourself and focus on Jesus Christ. And yet underneath the immense frustrations he had to have been feeling as he got the reports from this church and the things that they were going through, underneath that is the heart and the concern of a father. A man who spiritually adopted these people into his own family, which was the family of God. And in a time when the families of, of this world are completely breaking down, I believe there's an urgent need for more Christian men and women to have that same heart as Paul, a heart for adoption. So the question I want to pose to you is, what will it take? What will it take for us to spiritually adopt people into God's family? And I want to give you two basic principles of spiritual adoption from this passage. Very simple, very practical. First, we must love people biblically. And then we must model Jesus diligently. We love people biblically. Look at verses 14 and 15 again. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Notice Paul calls the Corinthians his children, his beloved children. And you can already sense a deep concern for their well-being, for their future, that they, they find the path in life that will lead them to fulfillment and joy. And how did he show this kind, of, this kind of love? Well, first he warned them in verse 14. Now we're going to understand what this word warned means in a moment, but notice what the word is in contrast to, shame. And so right off the bat, we understand that Paul's heart and warning, his approach to them was emotionally sensitive. He wanted to warn them about something very important, but he didn't want to do it in such a way that they would feel ashamed or condemned. 
This is very important. Now the word warn in the Greek is nuthateo, and it actually means to caution or rebuke gently. See, biblical love comes to someone as a family member, treats them with the respect, acceptance, and love that would be shown within a family. It's unconditional love. It's unconditional acceptance. But notice, this kind of love is also confrontational. And so, I have a definition for you. Biblical love means caring enough to confront and confronting in a caring way. This is what Paul meant. Caring enough to confront and confronting in a caring way. Do you know why many Baptist churches are taking the word Baptist out of their church names these days? Have you thought about why that's happening? How many of you have heard of Westboro Baptist Church? Anyone heard of them? Google them if you want to puke. Westboro Baptist Church, they claim that they're loving people by warning them about their sin. This is how they love people. They call them every derogatory name in the book. They condemn anyone serving in the military as going straight to hell, no matter what, for serving in the military for a nation that accepts homosexuality. They throw, they throw fruit at the gay pride parades, they try to blow up abortion clinics, they attempt to assassinate abortion doctors, and then they go on TV and say, oh, we do it because we love people. We just love them. How did Jesus confront people? You say, he told them the truth. You're right. He also died for them. He also died for them. See, God wants the church to be a people that will band around the cross and love each other unconditionally in a way that would enable everyone to help each other grow closer to Jesus. How? Through confronta uh, confrontation with the Word of God. And I want you to turn to Ephesians to the right. Ephesians chapter 4. Very important passage. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Another letter of Paul. And to the Ephesians he says, And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, to do all the ministry. Is that what it says? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ look like? Read on. Verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which Every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. See, Paul says we need to help each other grow up in the faith. But how are we going to do that? By speaking the truth, the Word of God, to one another. How? In love. Speaking the truth in love. So he wants every one of us to learn how to confront and encourage one another with the Word of God, through the Word of God. But the attitude is very important in love. Maybe you feel like God wants you to say something to somebody in this room, somebody in the Sunday morning service, somebody in your Sunday school class. Man, you really got a problem. You really got an issue with something in their life. But if you don't love them, I can guarantee you one thing. God doesn't want you to say it. God does not want you to open your mouth. 
He may want you to confront them. He may want you to bring that issue up. But if you cannot do it in love, he would rather have you wait. Trust me. You see, if you don't love people, then whatever you say to them, it actually might have the opposite effect of what you're going for. Does that occur to you? That happens to me all the time. And if you don't love people, they will not respond to the most important confrontation you can have with them, which leads us to our next point. Not only did Paul care enough to confront them about the small things, he confronted them with the gospel. Look at verse 15. He says, I have begotten you through the gospel. See, this was the primary way they became his spiritual children. At some point, he lovingly and patiently confronted them with the most important issue in their lives, their relationship with God. By the way, do you understand that that is the biggest issue in anyone's life? You know, we have to look beyond the symptoms the surface sin. And we have to see into the real problem, the spiritual core. They don't know Jesus. They don't have the resources to solve their own problems. Romans chapter 1 says that through their sin, through suppressing the truth and their unrighteousness, God has given them up to a worthless mind. They are under the wrath and the judgment of God. You should pity them. You should care for them. Because you were there too late. It's the spiritual issue. And that is the main confrontation that we need to have with people. You say, well, but Tom, we have a saying in Christianity. <clears throat> Preach the gospel. If necessary, <coughs> use words. Now, most Christians like the sound of that. I did for a long time. Why? Because it means you don't have to talk to people about your faith. And many people would agree and say, yeah, that's me. I, I, I like to live my life in front of others without having to verbally share Christ with anyone. Okay, well, let's imagine for a second that I'm a doctor and I came into the room where you're waiting anxiously with your family for the results of your tests. And as I look at the x-rays, I think, hmm, gosh. If I tell the truth, they may not like what I have to say. They may even become emotional. And I can't handle crying. I won't say anything. Y'all you know, just act nice and hopefully they'll understand the problem and talk to another doctor that I help them. Would that make me a good doctor? No, that would make, make me a terrible doctor. Take it one step further. Let's say I have the cure for you. But it means that I have to give you a shot with a very big needle. And, and as I see you, I think, wow, this is really going to hurt a lot. Uh, I'll just smile and be sweet, and I'll hope that uh, somehow God miraculously heals them without my help. Would that make me a good doctor? Of course not. You see, a person standing with God is the biggest issue in their lives. It's a matter of life and death. And it is not possible let me repeat. It is not possible that we, the church, the only people on earth with access to God through the gospel, could be passive and somehow hope that people will make it into God's family. But then why do only 2% of Christians actively share their faith? I don't say any of this to shame you, but I want you to see it from a different perspective. Yes, there are legitimate reasons why we find it difficult to share our faith with people. And no one can deny that. I'm not going to. But understand that the opportunity before you is to demonstrate the unconditional love of God by helping someone who is hurting and suffering and beaten down by life, uh, suffering at the hands of their own confusion and, and, and desperate choices. Usually because no one has taken the time to love them enough to teach them how to be successful in life. And you hold the key. You hold the key that could potentially open a whole new life to them through the gospel. Jesus said, I have given you the keys to the kingdom. He said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Now you might say, I've, I've tried sharing with people, but they won't listen. 
They don't want to hear it from you. Have you given them a good enough reason why they should? Or is your friendship with them based only on their receptivity to your message? Will you only befriend them if they come to the church and show respect for God? See, at the end of the day, this is the real question. Is your love for them conditional? Because if it is, they'll see it. They live in a world of conditional love, performance-based love. And they can smell it a mile away. And that's why Jesus said that the world would know us by our love. You see, it's supposed to be something different than the rest of the world. It's supposed to be noticeably different. And Paul understood that. And through him, the gospel was released into the city of Corinth. And that place was so immoral that it made San Francisco look like Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable the things that were happening in that city. Really, this is the kind of thing we're experiencing with the young people that God is bringing into our home. These kids are lost. Their parents are lost. We're meeting more and more who have been abandoned by their parents and are being raised by their grandparents. So many. It's, it's staggering. We met parents who, are, who will be brutally, uh, verbally abused right in front of us. And standing at the door, they'll just talk to their kid in the most incredible way. See, these kids, they need a friend. They need someone to love them in a different way. And so we open our home to them. We make ourselves available to them. And they come whenever they want for any reason. They participate in our lives. They come over for our 12-hour cooking days. I don't know if you know this, but Jen and I, we, uh, well, Jen, makes all of the meals for the whole month in one or two days. And, uh, you know, it, it sounded like a good idea at first. <laughs> and we did it. We got through that first month, and it was great. I mean, it was glorious. We got enough food for the whole month. We didn't have to worry about it. We ate out less. We spent less money, and it, it achieved its uh, objective. Month two, three, we thought, man, this is this one cooking day is really bad. Well, so we just started inviting the kids to come over and help us. And we have an army of kids that will generally come and help us cook all this food. And then we have uh, an army of babysitters who will come and watch Julie while we do it. You know, we, we invite them in into everything that we do. They've, they've come over and they've done yard work with me. And we just talk to them. We take an interest in what they do. And since then, the number of young people that have come through our home has tripled from what we started with. Why? Because they're getting their needs met. And guess what? When we open the Bible with them, they listen. They ask questions. And some of them have even come to Christ. Now I'm convinced of this. Any church that cultivates this kind of environment will have a hard time keeping people out. Because they're pursuing people. And when you pursue people, you're not just telling them that they're worth it. You're showing them. And this has a way of softening their heart and priming it for the gospel. Pre-evangelism. You see, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But so often it seems like Christians say, here we are, you lucky sinners. Come to church, then maybe we'll pour out a little gospel from our flask. And you say, that's not what I think. I sincerely believe that's not what you think. But if you aren't actively taking your faith outside of this place and pursuing people to bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, then the result is the same. The result is the same. Do you love people in a biblical way? Do you love them enough to care for them and confront them? There's a second aspect to spiritual adoption in our passage. Not only must we love people biblically, but we must model Jesus diligently. Look at verses 16 and 17 of 1 Corinthians 4. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me, Paul says. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, 
who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul said, imitate me. Actually, that's the basis of this whole sermon, that we should imitate Paul, not only as a shepherd or an evangelist, but as someone who spiritually adopts people as the fulfillment of God's will on earth. That's what we talked about last week. That's what it's about, to seek and save the lost and to gather them into one fold. And Paul says, this is what I'm doing. You should do it too. But let's expand on this. In chapter 11 of the same book, in verse 1, Paul adds something important when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. See then, back in our passage, he mentions that Timothy was sent to remind them of Paul's ways in Christ. So from this, we can understand two primary things about what it means to model Jesus to people. First, it means to follow Jesus practically. See, when Paul says to imitate him as he imitates Christ, he's basically telling them to live out their Christianity in the same way that he lives out his. But the question that should come to our mind is, is Paul really imitating Christ? Is he really following Christ? See, this can be very dangerous for somebody in church leadership, for somebody with so much weight on their shoulders. If they're not following Christ, plenty of people were following him, but who was he following? And when you read through the epistles, you understand that Paul dealt with this objection very often. In many of his letters, he had to defend his credentials as an apostle of Jesus Christ because people were constantly calling that into question. But the fact was, it was very clear that Paul was following Jesus Christ. It was obvious. Now, why is that so important? Because God knew that Paul, as a leader of people, would be trusted to model the Christian life the way a father models his life before his children. Has any parent in here ever said to their kid, don't do what I do, or do what I say, not what I do. Right? <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. Who said that to their kid? Go ahead, don't be shy. <laughs> no one? I've got a couple people. How would that work out? That doesn't work? It didn't work for my mom. I mean... <laughs> And, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to work for Jubilee. <laughs> it's unbelievable how well she mimics us. It's kind of scary. You know, and here you are, you're just enjoying your kid, and then you do something, she does it back and go, oh, no, 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 reverse. Let's rewind. I'm sure that all will get worse. <laughs> See, Christianity is the same way. It's caught more than it's taught. That's why it's so important that we're following Christ. Because that's what you're going to end up reproducing. You know, most of what I learned about the Christian life, I learned through the model of certain men who befriended me. I learned how to pray from my best friend, John, who I met in Orange County when I lived there, and I went to Calvary Chapel. And uh, he would just stop and pray. We would have conversations and I would bring up a concern. It's what I thought was small talk. And he would interrupt me and he said, let's pray about that right now. And he would pray. I don't care where we were. We'd be in the car. He would pray. Eyes open. Start talking to the Lord about it. When we would clean up after evening services, he would always go to take the trash out. And uh, every once in a while, I'd see him taking the trash out and he would be talking. While he was walking across the campus to the dumpster. He was praying. He was talking to the Lord. You know, by the way, if you don't know, that's how the disciples got the clue about prayer. Every time they looked for Jesus, where did they find him? They found him praying somewhere alone. And you you know, at some point they probably thought, man, this guy prays all the time. I wonder if this is a biggie. Should we ask him? Let's ask him. Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice I said, teach us not how to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to have the kind of constant relationship 
you have a new father. My buddy John, he also taught me how to get in the Word in the mornings and have a quiet time. He showed me how to take sermon notes just by doing it in front of me. Eventually, I just started asking him what he was doing and how he did it. And then I bought a little notepad, just like his. I sat right next to him, started taking sermon notes. He also taught me how to strike up spiritual conversations with total strangers. Amazing, this guy's talent for that. He showed me how to preach the gospel boldly in any situation. I mean, I'd be getting ready to run by the time he started going. I'm like, is this, this going to work out? Are you going to get hit? What's going to happen? You can just go for it, man. I learned how to serve with a Christ-like attitude from my friend Steve, who's now a pastor in Lynch County. I watched him week after week exercise great faith as he ran a food ministry that was exploding. By the way, that's what happens when you give free food out. And I was thinking, Lord, what's he going to do? Man, this guy would get up every day and just make it happen. The Lord would continue to provide it. He would just expect it. I learned how to study the word accurately. Because one of my teachers at the Bible college spent considerable time with me outside of class to teach me how to study the Bible. I also learned how to teach the things that God was showing me through discussion by sitting in his classes, whether I was enrolled in them or not. I've learned so much about biblical counseling from Pastor Rick, the art of listening and asking questions to help people identify and solve their deepest problems. I'm learning how to preach because of Pastor Dewey. He mentioned this morning that I'm getting better every time. What he didn't mention was that after every time I preach, he gives me an unbelievable, very precise, I'll be not use nice words, very precise evaluation. Let's just say I'm not always looking forward to it. <laughs> you know, his first, the first sermon I preached here on a Sunday night, Pastor Rick was gone, uh, Pastor Dewey was not even yet on staff here, and he agreed to evaluate me, and he took me to Carl's Jr., and his first words were, considering the fact that you have no clue what you're doing, that was pretty good. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and she, she, she evaluates Pastor Dewey's sermons. She's harsher than he is. <laughs> but see, the funny thing about this is, about these men is that they, were, they, they weren't always extremely intentional about training me. There were classes or formal sessions where we would go through a book on biblical counseling or evangelism or preaching. They taught me out of the overflow of their life. They taught me by example. And over time, I would catch more and more of the picture. So that's the first aspect of modeling Jesus. Following Him practically until your life looks like His. Not perfection, maturity. You begin to show His graciousness, His forgiveness, His mercy, His compassion, His humility, His love. And then once we're following Christ, then it is our responsibility to train others intentionally to do the same. And that's the second thing about modeling Christ diligently. It means to train others intentionally. Now Paul had sent Timothy in verse 17. He says, I'm sending Timothy to you to remind you of my ways in Christ. This is what we call discipleship. This means that Paul trained Timothy in those ways. Very precisely. Paul was able to send a representative of himself anywhere he wanted. Someone who learned how to walk with the Lord and minister to others directly from Paul for the purpose of teaching others to do the same thing through Timothy. It's the ministry of multiplication. And by the way, that was the plan for the church. Jesus didn't say, invite people to church. Go and pass out flyers or cards. He said, no, go and disciple them. And this covers the whole process. From leading them to faith in Jesus Christ, 
to showing them how to walk with the Lord. But it goes beyond just training. Paul called Timothy his son in the faith. In fact, he, he spoke that way of Timothy many times in his letters. And the idea is that through Paul's biblical love for people, he spiritually adopted this young man, Timothy, and he taught him how to bear the family resemblance. And Paul did this so thoroughly and so intentionally. And these two men were in such harmony. As he said in another letter, there is none other as like-minded with me as Timothy is. And Paul would send Timothy to the churches on his behalf to teach other believers how to bear the family likeness as well. And I have no doubt in my mind that this was the assignment that Paul had very clear in his mind. This is what he was really about. Jesus said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. That's what we're supposed to be about. But it's not some militant, forced thing. It's not a class. It's not a program. It's not discipleship night after a meal. It's loving people. It's confronting them with the real issues in their life. It's getting at the spiritual core. It's teaching them how Jesus Christ relates to every area of their life and modeling it for them. I don't know about you, but I cannot fix anything around the house. Okay? One of the wonderful things that Jen's grandfather left to me was to show me a couple things <laughs> with the screwdriver. <laughs> okay. And now he's gone. And, I, and, and one of the things that saddens me most is, man, that guy had to do everything. And his body was completely failing, but his mind was so sharp. And he could explain it from A to Z, I mean, exactly what I needed to do. Well, so, now that he's not with us, now that he's in heaven, guess where I turn? YouTube. <laughs> Anybody else do that? Yeah. You can find a video, I found that out, that people post on those random things, how to, whatever. I, I just go straight to YouTube. And you know what, I see it. I get to see it visually. And then I walk in to the house and I do that thing, and Grammy comes around the park and says, wow, you just, you just went and did that thing like you knew what you were doing. <laughs> I wouldn't have even thought of that or this and that. I said, I saw it. See, if I can see it, I can mimic it. I understood it. I interacted with it. I got the picture. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, this is really, really where spiritual adoption leads us, and I just want to close with this thought. Now, Jen and I have told many of you that we want to have five kids. And I think most of you think we're crazy. Is that accurate? And we've heard everything. So whatever you say, I won't hurt my feelings. You know, wait till... You know, wait a while with Jubilee, or wait till after the second one, and then you'll change your mind, or whatever. Or f only five? I mean, we've heard that all of it. <coughs> but we're still planning on it. And we, and we really, truly believe that God gave us the number five. Whether born by Jennifer or adopted into the family. We have this conviction about the number five. Now, you know why we're excited to do that? You know why we don't really care? what someone might say about it? Because to us, parenting is about discipleship. To us, it's about making little disciples. It's about having the position of the greatest possible influence in a person's life and laying a foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, a foundation, by the way, that I was not given as a child. And I've wasted a lot of time. I didn't get saved until I was 20. And, and the sheer prospect of what my children can do in their lives for the Lord. If I could somehow be in position to help them avoid the waste, the world. It's exciting. 
They could go way beyond what I could ever do. That's why we want children. By the way, that's why God gives any of us children. Because he desires godly offspring. It's definitely not for our comfort. And it's definitely not for our reputation. It's not always fun. It's not always exciting. Kind of bounces from one end of uh, one extreme to the other in the same moment. I, I, it just, it's amazing to me how Julie can throw the biggest fit and then immediately go into the biggest smile. Her countenance is glowing. She goes from like angel to devil in, in one instant. See, that's what it's really about. Adopting people in your family, teaching them how to walk with the Lord, teaching them how to obey Him, teaching them how to find life more abundantly. And I think that was the vision of the church in the first century. See, for them it wasn't about church properties or Christian societies or evangelistic crusades or church gimmicks or worship wars. It was about one thing. Growing the family of God. Growing the family of God. So what can we learn from this? Two things. Number one, our church family must grow because God's family must grow. Our church family must grow because God's family must grow. That's why we're here. You see, there is no biblical basis whatsoever for anybody in this church to say, no more people. Or, or these people only. Not those people. The first century Christians were fishing outcast babies out of the river and taking them straight into their home. They didn't discriminate. Secondly, real, genuine, lasting church growth happens one relationship at a time. See, who has God placed in your life to adopt? Your 8 to 15 is your spiritual family. Okay? It's the people that God has already put in your life. He's already begun building the bridge to them. They're believers. They're unbelievers. They're in all different places in their life. And God has committed them to you. You say, well, I don't want that burden. That's fine. You don't have to take it up. But really, he did it to give you an opportunity. Urgent need? Absolutely. Incredible opportunity? For sure. Opportunity for what? To do ministry the way Jesus Christ did ministry. I hope you read the Gospels. I hope you hold the Word of God up to yourself like a mirror. What an opportunity we have in such a desperate community to do the genuine legitimate ministry of Jesus Christ. So, who are your 8 to 15? Who are those people that are close to you? Are you praying for them? That's where it starts. Man, you, you will learn to love them as you pray for them. God will give you a supernatural burden. So you don't have to feel bad if you don't have it yet. God will give it to you, I, I promise. Are you serving them? Are you finding opportunities to bless that neighbor, that co-worker, that person at the donut shop, whoever. Are you seeking opportunities to share the gospel with them? That's really the question at the end of the day, if this is our purpose. See, you may not have as much time as you think to fulfill God's purpose in those situations. They may not have as much time as they think they're going to have with you. Are you busy about the work of loving people biblically? And are you modeling Jesus to people diligently? That's the question I pose to you tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing us so clearly 
through your servant Paul, what is truly involved, what is behind the heart of ministry, adoption, bringing people into our lives, into our family. And God, we just confess now that that sounds scary sometimes. And sometimes we don't even trust that you would bring someone we even like or feel safe around or whatever the situation is. But Lord, there are people around us everywhere that need you. And we have you. And you have told us to share what we have with them. Father, I pray that you would convict us of our failures, not to shame us, but to motivate us. For the time is growing short. And one day we will stand before you and give an account, and some of us will suffer loss, but we will be saved as though by fire. Lord, we want to love you more. We want to love you as we should. Guide us as we seek people out, as we pursue them. Put to rest our fears and help us give us supernatural grace and ability to love them, even when they're alone. And Lord, may you bear fruit from their lives and show us that our labor in you is never in vain. I pray that in Jesus' name. If you want to respond, the altar is here. If you want to dedicate yourself to this work of spiritual adoption, that's what it's going to take for him. That's what we're experiencing in our home. And uh, I'm so blessed by that. And I just want you to experience this same blessing. But understand, it is very urgent. And I think you all know that when you drive around the streets. It is very urgent. Thank you for listening.